Welcome to The Darkness Underneath. This is more than just a podcast. And if you're weak and triggered easily, or just some annoying little kid, go watch something else. If you watched my last episode, The Butcher of Brooklyn, you already know that I'm writing a new book on Roy DeMeo that will include a lot of new information, new victims, all kinds of things, with a different style. I speak to people from Murder Machine every day, and have files and info that's just not on the internet. I also know people that were heavily involved in Roy's schemes that aren't in Murder Machine that I found out through my research and talking to these people. I hope when I finally release my book, you check it out. I can tell you already, both Albert DeMeo and Capiche Mustaine in Murder Machine got Dracula's bank robbery wrong. That was Roy trolling his son and the crew with different stories. Dracula didn't get caught for not being able to drive a stick shift, and he didn't dress in drag, but the robbery was just as funny, and the aftermath was even funnier, and he has a fascinating history. I'll go into all that in detail in my book, among other things, as much as I can find. And if you know people involved in Roy's crew, or personally involved with its players in some way, and can prove it, let me know. I'd like to talk to them. I'm willing to have a respectful conversation with anybody, without judging, I want to humanize everybody in some way, and there could be money in it for them if uh, they're important. Again, they have to prove it. Also, if you haven't checked out Lynchpin of Bensonhurst, go ahead and do so. It's a great documentary on Montiglio. Also, check out Kevin the Informer's channel. It's on Roy DeMeo and Brocchini. Whether you agree with his conclusions or not, he wrote a good book called Cop Without a Badge. It came out in the 90s, and he was a car thief back in the 70s, and he did no Brocchini. I would recommend not bothering with Mafia tapes. It was terrible, edited to be duplicious, unethical. It exploited an old man, Montiglio, as he was dying, and the woman who produced it and interviewed him somehow made it about her. What a narcissist. Since the Mafia tape girl decided to be an opportunist and smear an old dying man, I'm going to take the good parts of Mafia tapes out, of which there isn't much, and limited to a very few old, few-second short interviews on Roy's crew, and with fair use, include them in my series, so you don't have to wade through Mafia tapes yourself. She literally spends most of the series, almost all of the series, talking about her personal journey. Oh, I traveled to meet such dangerous people to make this series for you, so you can learn about the crew. Speaking of Pete LaFrosha and Montiglio, the latter who had just had a stroke? What a cowardly, self-absorbed thing to say. She acts like she interviewed Ted Bundy or Hannibal Lecter out in the middle of the desert. She also suggests that Dominic Montiglio was a liar without any evidence, and that he died because he just couldn't take all of her powerful questions. And then she also took his phone without his knowledge, flipped through it, and got Buzzy's number, he hung up on her, and she did other underhanded things like that and edited the tapes. Now, let's begin.
Ginny McCabe and Anthony Nelson had declared war on the Mafia. Going after Cosa Nostra and menacing killers such as Roy and Nino meant Anthony and Kenny had to be more careful about where they discussed their work. Their enemies could be listening anywhere outside of their homes. If they didn't trust the owner of a restaurant, they would meet there. If they were on good terms with the restaurant owner, well, they usually chose hours when most mobsters and wannabe thugs didn't frequent these places during their discussions. If a mobster spotted them in a restaurant, they might not be able to listen in, but they still might stiff the staff just as a fuck you for waiting on cops. Who would have known? Gangsters weren't known for their maturity. Anthony and Kenny didn't simply discuss Cosa Nostra, though, or even other job matters at these diners and restaurants. They'd talk about everything, just like you do, off work or on your downtime. Politics, rumors, day-to-day -day events, the things people usually enjoy discussing. Of course, sometimes their topics would turn to the movies. And one popular film in particular that would pop up in their conversations was Godfather 1 and 2. Whenever a character reminded them of some real-life mobster they were investigating, or knew about, eh, they'd grin and chuckle and point it out. However, you can bet none of these characters in Godfather they discussed reminded them of Roy DeMeo. Although they hadn't fully realized the extent of Roy's depravity just yet, the Butcher of Brooklyn, who cursed and seized his crotch to make a point, didn't have much in common with the old-fashioned Gambino or Mickey Splane types. Perhaps if the pair had known Roy better, they might have thought of a hybrid between the homicidally crazed Leatherface from Texas Chainsaw Massacre and a smug Al Capone. Or, if those films had been around yet, they wouldn't be around for at least five more years to ten more years, maybe they would have thought of Freddy Krueger or Chucky since they were smack talkers. But whoever they thought of, it sure as hell wasn't Marlon Brando or Al Pacino, if they thought of anybody when it came to comparing Roy to somebody. Now, Anthony Nelson by now was every bit as threatening to the crew as Kenny McCabe, and DeMeo's thugs were just as aware of the quiet man as they were of Kenny. Once, Anthony walked into the Gemini Lounge when it was mostly occupied by Roy's loyalist goons, and you can imagine the response. It was dark inside, so dark he almost had to squint. And Anthony remembers the legions of cold stares, cold threatening stares, invisibly beaming through the darkness and glaring at him, pressing up against him from everywhere. None of them said anything, of course. And Anthony ignored their looks while he gazed defiantly around the room at them. And then he left. They were the ones that were really threatened. They knew Anthony and Kenny might bring them down. That's why they were so hostile. Now, Roy sometimes still tried to bribe Anthony, just like he tried with Kenny, but that was never going to happen, and Anthony wasn't even tempted. His mom had raised him with the best morals that Catholicism has to offer, and his military dad had been a very ethical man, too, who had taught him patience and discipline. At this point, Kenny and Anthony had become inseparable. Unfortunately, McCabe and Nelson had other duties, other crimes to investigate, and they couldn't just focus on Roy all the time. Now, it had been a week since Roy had killed that kid in front of the Gemini, because some spurned, junkie waitress told Roy the kid had called him a motherfucker. Roy believed her, and he had killed that kid without hesitation because he liked to kill. Whatever reason was there for, he was only going to get worse. And, unfortunately, although Nino had promised Montiglio he'd take care of it and bring Roy under his control, that simply never happened. There's no controlling Roy, no matter how many times Nino complained. And, even worse than all that, the crew was now in a frenzy, high, and ready to make anyone who offended them, for even the slightest reason, do the Houdini. They were under the influence of Roy, and not just the influence of Roy, the influence of Roy and Coke. So the next victim was Peter Waring. He was a 30-year-old party boy from the Bronx, and he sold blow for a living. Known Joey and Anthony growing up, and one cold January evening in 1979, Waring and several of his Coke-dealing colleagues took a trip to Terrytown, which is close to Sleepy Hollow, where the Headless Horseman supposedly rode. And there, they were going to meet up to do a big coke deal, but it turned out to be a setup at this hotel. They got busted. When it became apparent Waring was a rat because he got out of jail too fast, you would think the cops would learn. Well, Roy invited him to the Gemini Lounge. Come into my parlor, said the spider to the fly. 
And that's where they made meatballs out of him before making him do the Houdini. Now, on to more disturbing subjects, and I'm going to discuss this in my book in here, even though I risk the chances of it turning people off from wanting to hear the subject. But I feel like the victims deserve to for this to be known, and I also feel like people need to understand just how dark this was. Okay, so at this point, Roy invested in half a dozen adult entertainment businesses throughout the city, and one in Bricktown. Pernicious Greek figure named Gus Clavis was Roy's porn middleman guy and a minor crew member. He did most of the day-to-day -day operations and related to the sex industry venues that Roy and Nino invested in. He also acted as extra muscle when Roy and Nino extorted health spas that were actually brothels and when they forced their ways into becoming investors, such as at the Harem Spa in Bricktown, New Jersey. So Clavis was one of Roy's crew members. He wasn't as important, obviously, as the main guys. He was like a lesser crew member. So these sex clubs and sex shops that, and strip clubs that Roy had included prostitutes, wooden hot tubs, strippers, raunchy books, 8mm porn behind the counter, and STDs if you want those. Joseph Guelmo, he patroned these sex and strip clubs. He enjoyed strippers, not being the type of man who liked being tied down, unless he was part of some kinky crap. And he'd been married before in the 1960s, but that was enough for him. He preferred women's now with no strings attached or no papers attached. or Strings were all right, though, I guess. If they're attached, they could be taken off. He was a real sex hound. Now, one place Roy and Clavis were involved in was at the infamous show world, which DiBernardo secretly owned most of. So Capo DiBernardo was one of the men, but not the only guy who Roy got his sick pedo films from to sell to other venues. Roy was not a pederast, but he sold pederasts. Now, the pedo sick shit Roy and DiBernardo sold were being smuggled in from Europe, and the children that, that were on the films were ages 8 to 12. In America, DiBernardo and the others, they weren't producing it themselves. They were locating trafficked children overseas. One of the major sources of Roy's pornography, including the sick shit, were two men who produced and supplied it. And I have to say, I almost gave one an in memory of, because Murder Machine doesn't tell you this. Nobody does. Those documentaries just act like he was a big victim, but this guy was a piece of crap. One of the people who was selling Roy sick shit was Fred Todaro, and the other was his nephew Doug Briga, who was a bona fide sociopath or psychopath, if I've ever heard one. So the 50-something Frederick Todaro owned a building where he based his business, and during the day his business, Criterion Film Labs, was legitimate. They uh, copied normal films. However, at night, it became a place where they duplicated and produced low-budget smut films. And sometimes this would include adult performers who did hardcore, which wasn't particularly unusual by the standards of the internet today. It's You'd find plenty of it on Pornhub, I'm sure. However, they were also a major supplier for the sick shit. Not just to Roy, but also to other people, including probably Di Bernardo. So in 1977, after a seven-month investigation on a cloudy day in Manhattan, police finally found out about Todaro and Rega's operation, and they raided Criterion Film Labs. 4,000 child films were confiscated, along with 100 master copies. And that day, seven people were cuffed and jailed, among them Fred Todaro and Doug Rega. The police mistakenly believed Doug Rega and not Todaro was in charge because of his position as laboratory manager. Doug Rega and a co-worker just underneath him, Libretti, were charged with the hardest first-degree obscenity law there is. They could get seven years in prison. Make it even worse for Doug and Libretti, they were carrying guns concealed on them that day. And in New York, that's another seven years. This Doug Rego was looking at a potential 14 years. And what's he getting out of this? Almost nobody gets that unlucky, though. However, since they did do something as offensive as you can get, well, they were good candidates, and this made Rego nervous. I mean, even if they were sentenced only half that term between the two charges, that's still seven years of Doug Rega's life. And Doug Rega? Well, he started to really resent Todaro for getting off so lightly when he owned the whole company. But Doug Rega didn't have to worry about that. Doug Rega and Libretti? Well, they made the daily news not long after, and the headline said, Kid Porn Guys Get G-Rated Slaps. It's definitely not a headline you want above your name, but both men were probably excited that the judge only sentenced them to two months. 
Now, soon after the arrest, Todaro's wife decided she wanted to leave him. She didn't want anything to do with this, presumably. And she began fighting for the custody of the building where they made it. She wanted that, or she was going to fight for that. But Todaro, he was one step ahead of her. He handed the property over to Doug Rega so she couldn't get it, and the equipment as well. And it was agreed upon that until the divorce was finalized and everything was determined that it was to remain the Doug Rega's name. That was a serious mistake for Todaro. Doug immediately began to think about what he could do to make more money with this building. His uncle was stupid when it came to business, Doug thought, and he had decided, why is he busting his ass and getting all this negative attention when he's worked for years for Todaro and he kind of deserves this building? At least that's how he felt. Now, Doug decided he was going to keep the building, he was going to convert the rest of it into lucrative apartments. Now, eventually the divorce was finalized, and when Doug refused to give the building back to his uncle and begin making demands, Todaro was incensed and threatened to sue him back and take the building back from him and Doug was served with papers. He's not going to let Doug steal from him. Fuming, Doug showed up at Todaro's son's house one day brandishing a pistol. If your dad tries to get the building, he's going to get hurt, Doug said. Threats made his cousin only support his uncle more in the lawsuit. And when Doug's own brother heard about it, he also supported Todaro. So did the rest of the family. Doug, he was isolated on this issue. Then, on Halloween 1978, well, Doug and his friend, uh, one of his thug friends, came over to his Aunt Josephine's house that night, and uh, it wasn't for trick-or-treating. Doug and Todaro got into an argument, he was there, which led to fists being thrown between them, and soon, Doug and his pal were beating Uncle Todaro senselessly, and bruising him, really injuring him. Then they seized the screaming man and tried to drag him away, shouting and struggling. But when they realized they weren't going to be able to make off with him without getting a felony kidnap charge and going to prison, they decided, okay, they're not going to kidnap him, but you better give this up because you're going to get worse. Then during this period, Doug Rega began showing up at his own mom's house, which is Todaro's sister, and threatening to kill her brother, which is his uncle, obviously, if he didn't hand over the property. Mom became afraid of what her son might do to him, and he was also now angry at her other son, his brother, so she began secretly taping Doug Rega. And what was said was the following. I'm working very hard to create a situation for my family, and for that scumbag who stabbed me in the back, Doug whined. His expression then darkened, and Doug said coldly, It's getting to the point where I can't even restrain myself! My uncle and brother can share the same box! I'll break both their heads with a baseball bat! His mom at this point probably tried to reason with him, but Doug sputtered, I I'll, straight I'll straighten them out! They could, they could stay in the same hospital room as far as I'm concerned! I've had enough of this shit! This afternoon, it almost came to a head! I don't want to hurt anybody, but I don't want to be put in a position where, you know, that's, that's all! It's, it's as simple as that! 10, 15 years, I worked for Freddy. I wound up getting fucked now when I'm going to jail because of him. And he's still looking to steal from me. No matter what happens, he's still looking to steal from me. Doug's temper tantrum to his mom didn't really remedy anything. And Doug began considering other solutions. Now, Doug, of course, knew the most dangerous man in Brooklyn, Roy DeMeo. And months after that miserable Halloween, Doug told Roy about his problem and asked if he'd be willing to take care of it for him. Oh, sure. Roy'd be willing to help. Ten thousand dollars. Doug was probably caught off guard by such a cheap offer, especially from a top-tier professional killer. Of course, Roy probably expected more in the way of an investment or some favor, but Roy didn't need much of an excuse to ghost somebody, especially some poor schmuck these days that he could easily get away with. And Doug agreed, eager to get rid of his uncle so he could relieve himself of all the stress. Start making money already. After all, he could trust Roy. Roy was somebody who recently just whacked a guy named Carfero because he had allegedly raped one of his associate's daughters. So he was pretty confident Roy could get the job done. When Roy learned Tadaro was looking to buy a car, he had Freddie offer a fancy used one. Come to the Gemini Lounge, have a look. We'll be there at the clubhouse behind the back. Oh, okay. Tadaro agreed. He knew these guys. Freddie knew Roy planned on killing Todaro. He had never seen anybody killed at this point, and he didn't know how it was done or what would Roy do to the body. It was early evening on February 19th. Freddie DeNome stood shivering on the sidewalk outside the clubhouse. His figure would have only been dimly visible in the dark thanks to a street lamp. Flurries sprinkled his fuzzy hair and coat, carried on a sharp breeze. The blizzard had come out of nowhere and filled the city with snow. By morning, there'd be over 20 inches. The snow and cold, though, probably weren't what was on Freddy's mind. Freddy Todaro's car pulled up along the curb. The old man parked and got out. 
Freddy came over and greeted him. Hey, what's up? Paraphrasing. It was surreal knowing this guy was going to be dead in just a moment. In the clubhouse window next to the door, somebody peeled back the blinds and watched them. His white pupils scared colder than the winter weather around them. Well, they fixed on their prey. Freddy trembled. It was Roy standing in the lightless living room, gripping his forty-five in one hand and a dangling pillowcase in the other. The boss had come to starve for these killing moments. Tadaro, he didn't notice anything was amiss. The flash of Roy's eyes had been quicker than the flicker of a candle before they were gone. Freddy unlocked the clubhouse door and Tadaro came in first, while Freddy followed. They were just inside the corridor, leading to different rooms, a corridor that suddenly had become more than just a corridor. It had taken on much larger dimensions than that, at this point, the way Freddy saw it. Freddy began leading Tadaro to the left. Like an insect caught in a spider's web, Tadaro was a goner now. What happened next was just like a reoccurring nightmare that happened so many times before, but for Freddy it was the first time. He would always remember the terror that followed. To your left, once you enter the clubhouse near the Gemini Lounge, there's a common room, although Murder Machine refers to it as a living room. Their living room is technically to the right. But they have a common room. And that connects to the kitchen, which further leads to the bathroom. Now, to your right, there's another room that they had converted into a larger living room. And across the hall was Dracula's bedroom. Above is an apartment that Freddy's family had allegedly stayed at that was later converted into an ammunition and weapons storage area. There is some discrepancy between Kabichi and what the detectives told me that I will have specified when I edit the following passage, and will mention it in future episodes. Chris leaped out of the common room threshold in nothing but jockey shorts, his pale flesh gleaming in the light. He swings around, facing them in one athletic motion. He's gripping a butcher knife. Chris immediately then charges towards them, like some kind of primitive savage, with eyes that are wild and deranged. Freddy whimpers, paralyzed, suddenly forgetting he isn't the intended target. Chris is immediately upon them. You, over here, he said, seizing Freddy's arm and shoving him out of the way. Chris charged past Freddy. Tadaro was looking baffled. His last thoughts before he was murdered was what the hell was going on, more than likely. That's when Roy slipped out of the darkness behind him. He swiftly lifted a handgun with a suppressor attached to it and fired. The hush puppy is just a little more than a click. Death is immediate. Blood began squirting out of Tadaro's skull. His stare went blank, his body collapsing, before Roy, in one swift motion, wrapped a pillowcase around his head, holding him up. Crimson bloomed through the white fabric. Chris stabbed the corpse repeatedly in the chest. To stop the blood, Roy explained to a terrified Freddy. The first few strikes probably slung red before Tadaro's blood stopped pumping. Crimson streams slowly slogged their way down his shirt. It's over. One more body in the charnel house. One more body to be sawed apart and fed to the rancid hell that was Fountain Avenue dump. Joey and Anthony strode out. The police suspect another newer crew member appeared with them. Paul Dordell, one of their cocaine dealers. Been arrested with wearing but kept his mouth shut and stayed loyal to the crew. The men seized the corpse and dragged him down the hallway towards the bathroom, back towards the direction of the Gemini Lounge. There, in the bathroom, they stripped Tadaro until his corpse was naked. Whether he was just placed in the bathtub or hung isn't clear. Over the course of their period doing the Gemini method, Roy had several meat hooks installed like he used in his banner dairy days. Now, there are three different types of meat hooks. The S is probably the one he used. There were two that were particularly useful for something like this. Of course, they punctured the neck to drain it as much as they could. Now, it's time for pizza. Well, the blood congealed over the next 40 minutes. Once the body was properly ready, they dragged Tadaro to a blue pool tarp laid out in the living room. There, they cut him into six pieces, wrapping them in a garbage bag. They placed each piece in cardboard boxes and tied them up like Christmas presents. Freddy was surprised by how carefree Roy and the others were by the macabre violence. Roy might as well have been singing... I've been working on the railroad, while dismembering Tadaro. It had only been a little over a year since Roy had been made, and Paul seemed either indifferent or oblivious to a lot of what was going on in the Gemini Lounge. I suspect he didn't even know about it, other than rumors, which couldn't be confirmed. Nevertheless, several weeks after Tadaro's murder, a catastrophe would happen that would cause Castellano to permanently regret ever making Roy a made man. Big Paul probably wondered whether or not Roy was even safe to be around. He definitely began contemplating whether or not he should have this maniac whack for his cowboy shit. Now, this catastrophe would become known among wise guys as the Cuban Crisis. Now, here's a quick explanation of who the Cuban Mafia are. Since they aren't as well known as Cosa Nostra or the Medellin Cartel, 
which was run by Pablo Escobar. People oftentimes confuse the Cubans with the Colombians and Pablo Escobar's outfit. The Cubans were a major player among the myriad of criminal syndicates smuggling large amounts of cocaine from Pablo Escobar's operation, but they were only one very powerful and distinct criminal organization operating, and they were based in America. The corporation, which is what the Cuban mafia are called, that's their more specific name, it's actually a better name for them too. Well, they were run by Josie Miguel Battle Sr. Battle Sr. was a former corrupt cop who took bribes from Meyer Lansky and other mobsters before Fidel came in. He would kick those bribes up to President Batista, like many soldiers of the mafia do with their own bosses, and the whole Cuban system before Fidel, and I'm not, I'm not saying it was better after Fidel, obviously, but before Fidel, it was one that was rife with corruption and a lot of poverty. Then the Cuban Revolution happened, 1959, Fidel came in. At that time, Battle Sr. was forced to flee to America since he'd been an anti-communist and Batista supporter, and it didn't end there. Over the next four years, America, under the Kennedy Organization, and specifically the CIA, made a lot of promises to the Cubans who were anti-communist and could prove they were anti-communist, and Battle Sr. was one of them. Battle Sr., among a number of other Cubans, were trained and funded by the CIA, given a unit of anti-Fidel troops that were Cuban, and they were persuaded to go back in there and overthrow that commie Fidel. This led to the infamous Bay of Pigs disaster, which I hope to God you've all heard and studied in history class. You know what that is, but I'm not being condescending if you don't. Maybe, maybe not everybody has heard of it. But anyway, that's where America suddenly withheld military support, Fidel crushed Battle Senior's troops, as well as a number of other Cuban allies that were in there fighting. And after a miserable and humiliating imprisonment, which Kennedy had to negotiate for the release, Battle Senior was sent back to America. And it was not fun in that prison while he was there. He just felt horrible, and he was very angry and bitter at the Kennedy administration. And I actually can't blame him. Disillusioned, angry, and bitter, he became increasingly cynical when he came back. And after a brief service in the military, Battle Senior used his contacts to create the corporation, which continued to grow over the years. They were based in three places. One, in New Jersey, two, Miami, and three, New York City. Around the 1970s and 80s, the corporation was several thousand strong, so it rivaled Cosa Nostra in the number of people working for it. Very powerful organization. Pablo Escobar, well, he dwarfed the Cubans and Cosa Nostra combined. The Medellin cartel had over 20-something thousand strong as an army, and they drew among guerrillas and paramilitary forces who had been engaged in a long war in his home country in Colombia. Maybe I'll do a show on them sometimes, but I feel like Pablo's been covered so much. Pablo himself, though, that doesn't mean that he could bring these guys over here. A lot of people say, oh, who would win if Pablo wanted to wipe out the Cubans or the Cosa Nostra? Pablo couldn't come over here and wipe out the mafia. He had to contend with the American government and the CIA, and they were keen on controlling and minimizing Pablo's influence. If he started sending paramilitary groups into this country, even for criminals, they would crush him. He relied on these American crime syndicates and individual pawns. I'm sure you've seen Blow and heard of the cocaine cowboys. He also relied on his former nemesis, Griselda Blanco, to smuggle hundreds of thousands of pounds of snow candy through Florida. Florida was where everything was happening. Miami, Hollywood, Florida, and Fort Lauderdale. Now, coming back to Roy's world, which didn't have much connection to the Cubans yet. It was this guy, Charles Padnick, who used to do a little bit of minor criminal business with Roy. He was also the guy who installed some of Roy's bulletproof glass into his Cadillacs. He was the one who would lead to this crisis, but he did so indirectly and unintentionally. He wasn't a terrible guy, and his son would get caught up in it, Jamie, he was a shy, shaggy-haired kid who didn't really have any criminal connection other than helping his dad sell some cocaine to keep his, to pay Roy back. His dad, Charles, was one of Roy's loan shark customers, and he was just trying to run an auto shop at this point on Hollywood Beach. By the 1970s, specifically by 1978, Charles Padnick, his auto shop was struggling and in financial situation. He had moved to Miami in the early 70s. It's where he met Roy and Canarsie with his auto shop there, but then he decided he wanted to move to Miami. And if he didn't come up with some cash quickly, he was going to go to, out of business. So he borrowed from Roy, but the problem was that even though that kept his failing business going, 
it didn't help him pay Roy back. I mean, his business wasn't even making enough to sustain itself. So this guy Serrano, William Serrano, he came up with an idea. He was a worker for Charles at his auto shop, but he was also looking to make some extra money for himself and his family, as well as help his employer out. He wasn't necessarily a bad guy. You know, you get caught up in crime sometimes. Some people do. doesn't always make them a bad person. And loan sharks are great when you can't get any money from a bank, but that's until you have to pay back the ridiculously high interest rates and you don't have the money for it. And Chris and Roy aren't necessarily the guys you want to be in debt to. Chris can particularly get pushy, but Roy, well, he once chased a guy down the street who owed him, and the guy managed to leap into his truck and take off, but Roy, who was full of mindless fury at the time, feeling disrespected, this guy really, really must have felt disrespected in his life, tried to seize the guy's truck and hold it in place before toppling because it took off. That story comes from Frank Pergola. He thinks this is an example that I exaggerate Roy's intelligence. Nah, I think Roy had psychological problems. I don't think it was a matter of intelligence. So Serrano and the Padnecks told Roy and Chris they could get cocaine to pay Roy back and make extra for themselves. Although Serrano didn't tell Roy and Chris from where he got it. He had a connection from Peep, his friend, who they had worked together at an alcohol store. And Peep, he had another connection to a dealer in the corporation. And that identity of this powerful cocaine cocaine seller was anonymous. Cops think they know who he was, but on the street he was called El Negro, or the Black One, because of his dark complexion. Peep told El Negro that wealthy Italians in New York City were looking to purchase a lot of cocaine. Test run was set up, see if everybody could be trusted. Peep and El Negro were the suppliers in arranging the deal, but as far as they were concerned, they didn't even want these strangers to know they existed. They were staying in the background to watch. Serrano was given the responsibility, and Charles would introduce them. Charles' wife, Muriel, very nice woman. She died in 2010. A very innocent woman. She didn't know what was going on. In January 1979, Chris flew down to Florida and met with Charles. Standing outside his home, Chris and Charles discussed business in the latter's driveway. Muriel peeked out. Oh, what are these guys doing? Baffled. Hey, that's Harvey! They had known Chris since he was six years old. They knew his family, but they knew him as Harvey. They didn't know who Chris was. If you asked, said Chris to him, they'd be like, who's Chris? Muriel was polite, gregarious, and warmly smiled, invited Chris in, and was completely oblivious to the deal. Eventually, Chris and the twins met with Serrano and Charles at some undisclosed location. Serrano had a suitcase stuffed with enough baggies filled with cocaine for one kilo, a few pounds worth. And Chris and the twins exchanged money, probably tens of thousands in cash, for the cocaine. And while they were making the sale, Chris, he's always cocky. Well, he's introducing himself as Chris DeMeo because he's got a lot of hero worship for Roy. He's bragging that he's the son of this super powerful man in New York City. They conversed for a while. Later, Serrano brought El Negro and Peep their portion of the money. Serrano believed the Italians were reasonably trustworthy to do further business with. Well, Serrano couldn't have been more wrong. He'd been better off doing business with an entire sting operation because Chris immediately began plotting with the twins how they could just kill this Serrano next time and take the drugs for free. Oh, Charles might get killed with them, and I've known Charles since I was six. Eh, I'm not too close to him. Yeah, he's Roy's friend, but I don't think Roy's too close to him either. Chris set up another drug exchange with Serrano and Charles and promised half a million exchange for 12 kilos. So half a million, you consider that inflation, you multiply that, probably about two and a half, three million dollars by today's standard. Serrano went and told El Negro, and he agreed. This time he was going to send some people, though, to observe the situation because that's a lot of cocaine. He'd send his girlfriend to oversee it, he trusted her, and he'd send his cousin with a gun to act as a bodyguard for them. They fly out there, Chris and the twins, and now Henry's also in on it. They never intended on paying them. They just want to take the cocaine. They're like, the Serrano, who, what's he going to do now that he's dead? If you look at police reports, they say they invited him to the Gemini Lounge. Uh, that'd be more specifically the Gemini Basement. Informants later said it was actually at Anthony Center's basement. So there's some discrepancy there, and there's some details. I'm still researching it. Just know this. it happened. This happened at one of these basements, and Henry Borelli was hiding there. Chris goes to do the deal, and then they're pulling out guns, and they begin firing. Chris, the twins, and Henry coming out with a gun. They've got machine guns in some cases. And, you know, it's basements, solid walls, downstairs. 
they begin wiping these people out. The bodyguard, the cousin of El Negro, he manages to pull out his gun and shoot Chris in the head just as he's getting mowed down. Falls on the ground. Chris, oh! This is the second time Chris has been shot in the head and he survives just fine. That's incredible luck, by the way. Talk about the lottery winner. Chris has to go to the hospital that night. He's bleeding profusely and he tells them that he got shot by a motorist. So now they got the cocaine. Now they got the money. El Negro quickly becomes suspicious when his girlfriend doesn't call that night and tell him everything went down smoothly. So El Negro, he gets upset and contacts Peep, and Peep contacts Muriel, Charles' wife, and he wants to talk to Jamie. Jamie, of course, was in on it, not because he's a bad kid, he was just trying to help his dad out. He's that shy, shaggy-haired 20-year-old. You can see a photo of him above. So when Peep calls Muriel, it's late, he's frantic, asking for Jamie, but she refuses. It's like 1 o'clock in the morning. No. Though the call had to be unsettling, it was nothing like what was about to happen. Because the next day, Jamie hears about it, swiftly calls Peep, and immediately takes whatever money he has and flies to New York to see if his dad's all right. And when he gets there to investigate, he makes the mistake of asking Harvey if everything's all right, more than likely. Boom, boom. He gets buried with the others in Fountain Avenue. Chris, however, in his coked-up Caligula-level arrogance, underestimated who he was dealing with. There's only a problem here. El Negro had heard Chris DeMeo. DeMeo. Who's DeMeo? In this incredible circumstance, well, El Negro and Peep, they didn't know who Roy or any of these guys were. They did know a guy who was named Paz. And Paz was a close friend of... Dominic Montiglio, Dominic Montiglio actually bought coke from him. His name Paz Rodriguez. So Paz Rodriguez gets the telephone. He's like, I'll look into it. So when Dominic Montiglio comes that week, along with Rega, he says, could you find out who this Chris DeMeo is? Dominic's like, oh boy, he's in this situation now. Chris DeMeo, Chris DeMeo. Well, he doesn't know a Chris DeMeo. He knows a Chris Rosenberg. He responds. He knows that Matt Rega has probably already snitched when he looks at him. And he's like, I don't know who a Chris DeMeo is, but let me check it out. So he leaves. He's just amazed. Chris actually gave DeMeo's last name. He actually went that far because he's so obsessed with Roy that he would actually give his name and Roy's out. What an idiot. So he goes, Aggie, what the fuck have those cowboys done now? Nino says. When he sees that Dominic is looking upset, it looks like they set up a bunch of people. It took them out. Now the Cuban people in Florida are very pissed off about it. Well, Nino says, go to Roy, find out what's going on. Roy, he doesn't know what's going on, but he can figure it out real quick. Roy, he goes and he learns from his crew what happened. And Dominic, he goes back to his friend Paz, talks to him, and Paz says, yeah, we, we figured it out. It's this Roy DeMeo and uh, Chris Rosenberg. Because, you know, Rega's going to snitch on them all, and he's talking. He, he, Matt Rega, he just doesn't want to get killed. Montiglio tells them, he says, yeah, yeah, and he admits it. And, well, the Cubans, they're furious. They've assembled about 25 guys, and there are armed men standing there with Paz. And he says, look, this guy, El Negro, he doesn't want the bloodshed. He said, kill this Chris guy. We'll let it go. Meanwhile, when Roy DeMeo first heard what Chris did and asked, well, would you tell him? Paraphrasing here, Roy was horrified. The Cubans didn't play by Cosa Nostra rules. They played by Roy rules. When Nino called and told Roy to handle it and kill Chris, Roy's horror only grew larger and larger. For once that cold black heart of his began to grow brittle and break, he felt strong emotion pouring through him. Kill Chris? It's like asking him to kill Albert. Possibly worse. There's no way he's going to do that. Roy began stalling. Although Chris didn't know his death had been ordered, he probably was told to go into hiding, as twins probably were too. Roy also ordered Dracula to come with him and they hid out his large house, brandishing weapons, checking peepholes and cameras. Roy began expecting the Cubans to come at him and his family any moment. Once, after Henry returned from reporting to Roy and talked to Montiglio, he said, Roy's seen Cuban assassins everywhere. Roy's concerns weren't unfounded, but he was in no state to make rational decisions. Roy was already dangerously unstable as it were. A paranoid Roy? Possibly snorting coke at night to stay awake? Was a time bomb. And this would lead to a terrible tragedy that would change things forever.